This is Malik Cook from the University of Colorado, and the topic that we will be discussing today is, of course I took my drops, doctor, ways to improve adherence. This is the outline. I'll be discussing human factors, physician-patient communication, direct patient observation, and education, as well as some concluding thoughts. What are the numbers? Glaucoma affects approximately 3 million patients in the United States. It's the number one cause of irreversible blindness. 30 to 50% of these patients um, can be undiagnosed. One and a half million patients are in medical therapy, and this represents a three billion direct cost and nine billion economic burden to the United States. 50 to 75% of these patients are non-adherent to therapy, which means around a million patients are walking around non-adherent to their therapy. Some of the causes for non-adherence include things that, that are pretty intuitive. Uh, forgetfulness, patients just simply forget to take their drops. Physical limitations, a lot of our patients are elderly and unable to instill drops on the eye. Frequency of dosing and number of medications, we know that the more drops that you're on, the less likely you are to adhere to the therapy. Inability to visualize the dropper tip. Medication side effects. Inadequate education regarding use of drops, and of course cost is always a barrier. But one of the factors that was most interesting to me when I was um, early in my career was the inability to identify the correct bottle. You can imagine if um, our patients are taking more than one bottle, recognizing which bottle has which medication and which regimen they should be using that particular bottle uh, for uh, is extremely important. And I wanted to look into this a little bit more. We did some small studies at the University of Colorado, but it was followed up with a couple of studies that we um, completed recently that I'd like to share with you. One of the studies that we did here at the University of Colorado was a simple questionnaire of 126 patients. We simply asked them how they identified their bottle if they were on more than one medication. And the answers came back uh, that I think were things we could have predicted just from clinical practice interacting with our patients. The number one method that was used was cap color. Other factors included bottle size and shape, name on the bottle, bottle color, not just the cap color, but the bottle color itself storage location, and then box color and size. We followed this up with a study um, that we teamed up with the Hopkins team for. Uh, and this was a, a study that we did on 100 patients. And uh, we also had three doctors evaluating some of the results. And the way that we did this is we offered up to the patients 11 different bottle caps. And we asked them to identify what the particular color was for that, that um, cap. And very interesting, we got 102 different unique color descriptors. So if you had a cap color that was green, sometimes we got the answer of blue-green, sometimes turquoise, sometimes aqua. And um, I think most interesting was the fact that we didn't get agreement from the three physicians as to what the patients were trying to refer to. This is, of course, important because when we ask the patient what drops they're taking, they give us the color back, we assume that we know exactly what those colors mean because in the United States we have color coding for the different classes of medications. Of course, this does not exist in all places around the world, but in the United States this is one of the primary ways we communicate with patients. And it turns out that sometimes the patients, uh, actually I should say and not infrequently, uh, the patients are giving us a color that we are assuming belongs to a particular class, but the patients might be referring to something entirely different. And we should also say that there was a significant amount of um, color um, deficiency, vision um, uh, color deficiency within these uh, patients. So uh, that, of course, presented a limitation in them being able to identify exactly what drop they were talking about. One of the issues that is becoming um, more relevant to our practice is um, compounding pharmacies sometimes have uh, cap colors that don't correlate necessarily with the type of medication that's in the bottle. For example, in the United States, we use yellow for beta blockers, and some of the compounding pharmacies can put a yellow cap color uh, with medications that are not in the beta blocker family. Uh, this uh, can cause issues with communication, as you can imagine. Uh, what I have noticed in the community of compounding pharmacies is that this is being corrected. They're slowly trying to address some of these issues. It still pops up every now and then when I see patients. So what are some of the adherence aids? How can we help these patients? Early in my career, I used several of these that you see here in the pictures. Um, I tried to simplify the regimen without going to some of these visual aids. 
Um, I also tried some of these um, alarm reminders, uh, both the the Matapros, the Lumigen one you see in the bottom middle, as well as the Travitan dosing aid, which is in the upper right-hand corner. The Travitan dosing aid wasn't just an alarm device. It also allowed you to push a lever to install the drop. So if you had physical limitations, it made it a little bit easier. And there were other positioning devices like you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And frankly, I was, I was um, disappointed with many of these uh, because Patients didn't always hear the alarm. The installation device on the bottom left-hand corner, as well as the Travitan dosing aid, wasn't uh, perfect for a lot of the patients, so they didn't get all of the benefit that I hoped they would get. Well, we have these GAP therapies, guided administration of pharmaceuticals, that are being tested. These are patient-independent, physician-administered, and device-guided therapies that are not quite on the market in most places around the world, uh, but slowly going through the approval process and we should be seeing them in clinical practice soon. If I had a wish list for gap therapies, it would include um, a drug delivery method that was patient independent, physician administered and monitored, safety profile equal to or better than a prostaglandin analog, long duration of efficacy, six to 12 months would be ideal, repeatable for the lifetime of the patient. Of course, glaucoma is a chronic disease and we have to keep giving the therapy for the lifetime of the patient. And I would like something, of course, that is 100% adherent uh, to what I'm asking the patient to do. Gap therapies that have been studied include punctal plugs, subconjunctival injections, ocular surface inserts like contact lenses and things like that, and then intraocular injections. Punctal plugs have been around for a very long time and have been studied extensively in multiple studies. The pros for punctal plugs that dr deliver medication include the fact that they're non-invasive, they're physician-administered, patient-independent, but on the con side, unfortunately, retention has not been perfect in many of the studies unless patients who were specifically picked as being good retainers were included in the study. Oftentimes, there's about a 65 to 50% um, uh, dropout rate depending on whether you're looking at the lower or upper uh, punctum. Less effective than Timolol for a short period of time and many of the studies that have been made available, although there are not very many peer-reviewed publications or abstracts out there that we can point to. And then there's question of course of the safety issue. If the punctal plug falls out, how long will the patient go without therapy? Subconjunctival injections have also been around for quite some time. Anacortive acetate uh, was a, a drug that was studied uh, by Alcon years ago. That's what you see here in the picture. It's a milky um, looking medication that was injected um, underneath tenons. Um, now the, on the pro side, 100% adherence, you can do this at the slit lamp, so you didn't require a procedure room to do this. And of course it was patient independent, but on the downside, uh, this is more invasive than just a punctal plug inconsistent delivery. Some of the medication came out of the path that entered into Tenon's capsule. You would require frequent reinjections for some of these medications, um, but questionable whether some of the other companies that are looking at these delivery systems can improve on that. And then of course, we use the conjunctiva for filtration surgery. So if you do this multiple times before the patient requires surgery, will there be scarring in the conjunctiva that decreases the uh, chance for success of, of the subsequent filtration surgery. One of the more recent devices is called the Helios ring. That's the one that you see here in the bottom right hand corner. There are other ocular inserts, something called the Todd device, which is very similar to what you see with the Helios uh, device here, except broader, uh, but also rides over the eye in the inferior and superior fornix. You can also use contact lenses that would fit into this category. All of these have 100% um, adherence when they're uh, retained. Low dropout rate in the case of the Helios um, device, and many of these devices are quite large compared to a punctal plug, so if they do fall out, the patient is aware and can call the um, physician to let them know. You can get about six months delivery from many of these devices. Now, on the downside, it's a larger device, so there is greater discomfort and many of the studies did not show efficacy that was uh, equal to or greater than Timolol, so we're not getting really to that PGA level efficacy. One of the ones that we're hearing the most about right now are these intraocular injections. Um, the one that is probably coming to um, commercialization um, soonest is BIM-SR, which um, is coming to us from Allergan. 
There's another medication that was being studied called, um, the company was called Invisia. This was recent, recently purchased by Airy Pharma. And we're not sure exactly what's going to happen with the program for delivery of glaucoma medications now that Airy has purchased the company. On the pro side, all of these have 100% adherence. When you inject them into the eye, you know that the patient is getting the medication. There's question whether it's equivalent to a PGA. Some of the studies with Invisia that were done prior to the acquisition by Airy did show efficacy similar to uh, prostaglandin analogs. But essentially what we're seeing here from many of the studies is that the efficacy is similar to Timolol and that there's a reason to believe that we might be able to achieve slightly better than Timolol efficacy. Uh, but further studies are needed and we don't have our hands on all of the phase three data uh, that uh, BIMSR has um, available, although that should be coming out soon because the FDA just recently approved uh, BIMSR. It's not available commercially yet, and we don't have an exact date for when we're going to get our hands on this, but probably I think it's safe to say at this point that BIMSR is going to be the first one that we're going to have real-world experience with. On the con side, this is invasive. You're injecting something into the eye right now. Reinjection every four months or so, although the exact reinjection schedule is not 100% um, known at this point uh, because, again, we don't have the real-world experience with the medication. Uh, I wrote down here a question whether it's a slit lamp procedure. I think this uh, is more of a procedure room um, uh, installation. It's going to be much safer, much more controlled than doing it at the slit lamp, but that can improve over time with experience. Uh, we might get more comfortable with doing this at the slit lamp. And the big question, of course, is going to be endothelial cell count. Are we worried about endothelial cell loss with something sitting in the angle that could potentially move around uh, when the patient is also moving around? And what are the long-term implications of repeated injection on the corneal endothelial cell health? Now, we've talked a lot about all of these devices and what we think would be good for patient adherence. We haven't spent a lot of time on patient acceptance, even though we have some of these uh, new things that we can use on patients. Are they going to be amenable to stopping their topical therapeutics um, or um, skipping going to laser or surgery uh, in uh, an effort to use one of these devices and improve their adherence? We did a study in our clinic at the University of Colorado where we asked 126 patients some questions around this. What would their practice pattern, uh, what would their receptiveness, I should say, to the practice patterns that we might introduce with some of these uh, drug delivery devices uh, be if we um, went through some of the specifics for each one of these devices? And I was surprised to see that 45% of patients were accepting of more invasive procedures. Um, so I thought, well, okay, maybe we have a uh, a way to introduce some of these therapies into our clinic that would enhance adherence, and patients would be uh, very accepting of what we're offering. But we took that a step further in a study, again, with Pradeep Ramalu and his group, Ian Pitha, uh, from um, Hopkins, and we asked more specific questions now of 150 patients between both of our practices. And uh, I think the conclusion here, the take-home is extremely important. Patients considered sustained drug delivery as an acceptable alternative if it obviated the need for surgery or it demonstrated greater efficacy than eye drops. So in most cases, it wasn't enough to just give them an alternative that enhanced their adherence. They had to see a very clear advantage over topical therapy, whether it was to skip doing surgery or that they were getting better efficacy. So there are some nuances here when we're introducing these therapies into our clinic that we're gonna have to pay attention to. I doubt that 100% of the patients are going to say, yes, please give me that ring or give me that injection into the eye, and I won't try um, staying on some of these topical therapies, uh, or it would be worth it to um, skip going to a MIGS device or a TRAB or a tube. I think that the nuances there are going to be um, something we need to understand a little bit better in real-world practice.